Okay, I've started the recording and we will uh, post this on YouTube. The advantage, of course, for being part of uh, this live group is that you get to interact directly and immediately with the presenter. And uh, on the recording, obviously, you don't have that luxury. So we're delighted to have uh, Juliet uh, Frischi here. And uh, she is a physiotherapist and urban polling master trainer and owner of Pole Walking Australia. And uh, we're, we're delighted to have uh, uh, quite a few attendees. And we're looking Ooh. forward to, uh, to what she has to, to, to share with us. And uh, meanwhile, uh, as we get started, whatever, if, if everybody would mute their microphones, unless you have a question. And I will turn it over to Juliet, who will tell us a bit about herself, her group, and, and then share some tips that would be useful for, uh, for all the fellow Nordic walkers. Thank you very much, um, Leroy. It's, it's really great to be here. Can I just ask where Kari and Kathy are from, the other two that I don't that I don't know from here. Hey, I'm from the US and I'm in Tennessee and it's oh. early morning. And I'm also uh. a physio and a Feldenkrais practitioner and a Bones for Life practitioner. And I'm very interested in walk for life and pole walking for me personally and clinically. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm down the coast in Newcastle. Oh, hello, Kari. Okay, <laughs> lovely place. Yeah, it's so. is great. And uh, I, I haven't even started walking yet because I haven't got my poles haven't arrived. So I'm I'm completely new. Okay, well, it's great to have everyone here, and thank you um, for joining in. Um, so my name's Juliet Fritchie. As Leroy said, I'm a physiotherapist and um, an urban polling master trainer. I have also done training um, in the Nordic walking method with um, two other um, companies, um, and now I'm working exclusively with strapless poles. Um, I probably, I came into Nordic walking, I think Lero's put a bit of a, a blurb up, um, a, a few questions and um, answers on um, his page, but um, I came to Nordic walking in the early 2000s, so it was very new to Australia then, and the gentleman who, um, Mike Gates from Tweed Heads, um, the Australians would know where Tweed Heads is. It's not far from here now. Um, he taught me and he found it in Finland. He was in Finland and, and, and had seen them walking and brought the technique back here. But he called it pole walking because he thought Nordic walking is just never going to catch on in Australia because... Who we, we don't know anything about the Nordic um, anything. We're not in, anywhere near snow. Um, so I tend to revert back to pole walking when I speak about it. But pole walking, Nordic walking, urban polling to me all equal the same thing. So just to get that sort of clear with, with us. Um, so I used it in my... Um, uh, physiotherapy practice. I was in a small town and we didn't have much exercise around. So we, um, we started a group and they're still going today. Um, then I, I got so interested in it and I had a number of people who really did very well with the polls. So I did my um, honours at the local university. And then I came to Queensland and I did my PhD in the, basically the health benefits of Nordic walking in older adults. So that's kind of my where I sit because then I went back to being a physiotherapist. And, um, uh, and now I use it in my uh, clinical practice as well as running Nordic walking groups. So I run uh, walking groups, but I also run exercise classes with poles. So I have a group and we're in the outdoor area and we have our poles and we do a lot of just standing exercises with the poles as well as walking. And I'm also a member of our, nor of our um, 
of our local Nordic walking and urban polling group, which is called Bramble Bay Nordic Walkers. And um, we meet as, and we do a fitness walk on a Saturday morning. So we're very fortunate here. We have a lovely um, area to walk and um, a great group of, of walkers. So we do that. And then every now and then we'll walk in the forests and the, we do kind of a hiking Nordic walk as well. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm a distributor of urban poles now and I work exclusively with the strapless method of Nordic walking. So I thought I'd, I'd talk um, a little bit about what the strapless method of Nordic walking is to start with. Is that all right? That's probably a bit better. So this is um, a Nordic walking uh, urban polling pole. And I'll just go through what it looks like um, because most of you will be familiar with the strapped method that it's like a half glove that attaches you to the pole. This is um, a, the strapless method and, and all the different types of strapless methods are very similar in look. So the shaft, uh, let me see, I'll go that way. Okay, so the shaft is very like a normal shaft. It extends, I don't know if you can see that. Um, it extends and it contracts so you can open it and close it. And this is a twist mechanism. It's an aluminium shaft of pole and that's what it looks like. The boot is, again, I can't, oh, here we go. Okay, so that's the boot. And it looks very like a Nordic walking boot. So it's on an angle. So that's what the boots are. And uh, we call them boot shaped tips, but Nordic walkers will call them paws. So they have the angle tip because you're held, they're held backwards and you do uh, at a 45 degree angle. So that's very similar to what a classical Nordic walking looks like. The difference is in the hand grip. So that is a Nordic walking hand grip. A couple of things, I'll just go through the features of that hand grip of the Nordic walk, of the strapless method. You'll notice it's quite a large hand grip. It's not the thin one that the typical strapped method is. It's quite an ergonomic hand grip. You can hold it quite um, easily. The reason for that is that the developer of, of this particular hand grip, she, she looked around the world and, and found the strapless method and modified the grip. And she was an OT, her name is Mandy Shintani, and she lives in Canada. So this is a Canadian brand of pole. And she developed the grip because of being an occupational therapist, she wanted something that was comfortable for people, especially who were older. And she's a gerontologist as well, so works with older adults. So that's the hand grip. The thing that turns it into a Nordic walking pole is that. I don't know if you can, ooh, I'm so bad at this. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. That's a shelf at the bottom of the hand grip. So there's the hand grip, left-sided. I put my hand around like that and it is placed on the shelf. And that what's, is what stops the hand, the hand from falling off. So, yeah. So, but it does have a bigger shelf than that. It's a bigger shelf. So I cannot, I'm pushing quite hard and I'm not going to go anywhere. So that's where you get your push when you're using your Nordic walking technique. The technique is slightly different from the gloved technique. And this is why, because you have a light grip. So it's not, a, it's not a firm grip, it's a light grip all the time. And instead of, with a Nordic walking gloved grip, you go down to your hip and then you release your hand and you go further back. And then you release and then you grip again as you come up to that handshake position. So you get handshake position, pushing down and back, you get to your hip, you open your grip and you push it out behind 
And then as you pull it up, you close your grip and bring it in the front. With your strapless technique, you don't go past your, around about your hip. So you start in the handshake position, you go down to your hip, and then you just pull it back up again. So you never let go of the hand grip. It's always down, up, down, up, but it's a light grip because you've got that shelf there that will hold your hand on. So that's kind of the difference. Um, and, that's what a, and that's what makes it a strapless Nordic walking pole as opposed to a hiking pole, which won't have that shelf that holds your hand on it. So I hope that makes it a little bit clearer. Um, it's a slightly simpler technique because you don't need to push back and you don't need to learn your grip and release. Um, but apart from that, it's very similar to a Nordic walking technique. So I thought now, all being well, um, I would just move straight along to te a technical, uh, Leroy has asked me to talk about something <laughs> that might be of use to new or um, beginner Nordic walkers or any Nordic walkers really, just about technique. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick with the upper limb because last time we had, uh, and I've forgotten her name, but last time the speaker spoke about um, rhythm of, of, your, of your walking rhythm. So I thought I'd go with your upper limb and your arms. And I thought I'd talk about arm swing from the shoulders and give you a couple of tips about swinging from the shoulders when you're um, walking with poles. Um, I'll just get my, I, I have a couple of visual aids here, so don't laugh when I put them up, but um, they're, they're just a, a, physio, a physio picture um, and I'm not the best artist in the world. But um, looking, when I instruct people, I find that one of the difficulties when you're first learning to walk with poles is to get your arms and your arm swing and your legs working in sync. And oftentimes they start off okay and then they kind of go out of sync once you get moving. Um, so the steps to learning how to walk with poles are pretty similar. Usually you start, if you, if you go online or if you're being taught by an instructor, they always say, put your hands by your side and let your poles just sit out behind you. And, and so they're on a 45 degree angle and they're way out behind you. And then you walk and you drag the poles. And most people find that quite easy. And that's because it gives you an idea of where the poles are always to be held. They're always to be held behind you. So then what usually happens is the instructor says, okay, just try and walk naturally and let your natural arm swing happen. And so most people can do that really well and they're relaxed and they walk quite nicely and they're getting that left, right, left, right with the poles. Then the difficulty comes and that's when you're told to lift your arm up, up to a handshake position and push down that way. And there are a couple of things that tend to happen when you do that. The first thing is you lift your arm up and it suddenly goes out of sync with your legs. So you end up with a slower arm and your, and your pole's coming down at the wrong time and you're getting completely out of sync. Or the second thing that happens is you go, oh, I can just bend my elbows. And that works perfectly well. So you're not actually moving your arms from the shoulders at all. You just move them from the elbows. But you've, you've got a nice rhythmical pattern, but you're not doing the swing from the shoulders. Now, there's a, cup, there's a reason why that happens. And this is where my visual aids come in. So if you can imagine that your arm, I'm, I'm thinking left arm because I have to go either one or the other. I'll get mixed up otherwise. So your left arm is hanging by your side and imagine that it is the, the large hand of a clock 
So it's in the middle, your, your hand, that's, that's the centre of the clock and you're hanging it by your side and so your hand is at six o'clock on the clock. Now, if you're going for a walk and you're just, no poles, just a little walk and you're swinging your hand, your arm will come to around about seven o'clock. So this is my picture of... Oh, can you see that? Oh, there. Okay. So there's my little person. You can see her nose is pointing um, to my right, but see, she's, and her hand is swinging to seven o'clock. So it's going from, from six o'clock to seven o'clock. Just a nice little gentle arc. So that's what happens when you just start to swing your pole just gently and naturally. Now, when you're told to go up to a handshake position or bring your pole up higher, you actually have to swing higher. So there's my person again, same thing, starting at six, and she's moving up to say about half past eight, half eight there. So she has to swing up a little, quite a bit higher. And that is your typical Nordic walking technique. It's up a nice high swing with a straight elbow. Now what I've done here is I have stretched out those little arcs and I have put them as a straight line on a piece of paper. So you can see the bottom arc is the seven o'clock, just a little swing to seven o'clock. The top one I've straightened out and that's quite a long swing. So that's a much longer distance. You can see that you have to go a much longer distance to get it up to 8.30. So it's like the equivalent of travelling for a mile in five minutes and then travelling for two miles in five minutes. You've got to go faster to get the two miles. So that's why people go a little bit haywire when they're suddenly, you know, they're relaxed and walking nicely with their little seven o'clock swing. And then suddenly they have to swing higher and they have to swing faster. And that's where everybody goes, oh, I can't do it. And, and, and it goes out of rhythm. It's much easier to bend your elbows because you don't have to travel so fast and you don't have to swing right up. But if you're doing a proper Nordic walking technique, one of the things, one of the things that the research says is that it increases your energy. So one of the reasons we walk with poles is to get more energy happening. And if we're not, and one of the ways that energy happens is because you're swinging up faster and higher. And and so if you're not doing that, you're not actually exerting that extra bit of energy. There are a few, there are a whole lot of different little bits of your technique that go into improving and increasing your energy. But one of them is getting your arms up and getting a quick swing and pushing down. So how do we do that without going, you know, without completely losing our minds and going, oh, and getting stressed. So I, I had to think about this. I think, how do, you, how do you do that and get the quick swing coming up? So what the first thing, and something that Kate mentioned off air, was that if you have somebody with you and you're starting to chat, you tend not to be able to concentrate very well. So I usually like to say to people, after your lesson, go home and spend five to 10 minutes every day on your own practicing. And then you can just concentrate on your rhythm and you're not distracted. A nice straight road. So Purushottam has this beautiful, lovely, long road, straight road that he can um, practice on, which is perfect. You don't have to practice for a long time, but make sure you're alone and you've got a nice straight path unencumbered without any 
uh, distractions. Then you just do your seven o'clock walk. So just practice that small, little, light things. And you'll get to the stage where you're going in rhythm. You've got a nice, uh, let your legs are moving nicely. Left, right, left, right, left, right. And at the same time, your arms and your poles are going right pole, left pole, right pole, left pole, right pole, left pole. So you're, doing, you're getting that nice rhythm. And then instead of trying to lift all the way up to half past eight, to half eight immediately, try and go a minute more. So go a minute past seven. So we're going a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, just to a minute past seven. And you'll find you're just going minutely faster. And then you go, oh, this is all right. I'll do two minutes, two minutes past seven. So you're lifting up a little higher. And then you go to three minutes past seven. And then you gradually, just as you are comfortably into your, your nice rhythmic pace, you just lift up and you go a little bit more. It's like, um, it's like cooking a lobster. You know, they say if you cook a lobster, you put it, live in the pan and you just let it heat up slowly and it doesn't really <laughs> sorry sorry if anyone's a vegetarian but um that's the way to do it so just um minute by minute by minute and eventually you'll get to this nice high arm swing and you'll still be swinging from the shoulders um i'm i have to say i'm not a purist and so depending on the people I'm teaching, some of them will keep their elbows bent. And, you know, if that's comfortable for you, especially older people who need a bit more stability, then that's fine. But if you actually want to use it to get fitter, then you've got to start um, moving from your shoulders. Um, and that's the way to do it. So anyway, that's my, that's my little teaching, my little teaching moment. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. The floor is open. Hey, it's Kathy. Yes, so, Kathy. So I'm not part, I'm, I'm not a, um, I'm a, I'm a novice, like haven't done any Nordic walking at all. I'm having my first walk with a group here on Saturday, but I'm very familiar with using trekking poles and the work of Ruthie um, and about uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis and actually that we want that elbow <laughs> extension, that elbow flexion in order to generate the contraction around the shoulder girdle and its connections to the spine for that vibration to stimulate more um, bone density. Right. I mean, is that is that some of the research that you're seeing from from urban walking and Nordic walking as well? Um, I haven't seen a lot. To, there's not a lot out there to do with um, osteoporosis, osteopenia. There's a lot of um, muscular work on what muscles are using. Um, but your um, yep, yeah. and and the straight to bent um type of technique is not what nordic walking does um it's, it's a comfortably straight arm yeah like that like that so that's what happens it's a comfortably straight arm but as you push back on the pole so you put it down on the ground push down push back this these are the muscles that get used your middle back muscles and the things that I found with a lot of my, because I see a lot of older people, Thank you. is posture improves because they're using those muscles for an hour at a stretch. So they're actually getting, they're not just getting strength, but they're getting that endurance. Their muscles are able to hold for a good hour. Mm -hmm. It's just, they're switch on, switch on, switch on, switch on, switch on. So mm -hmm. Posturally wise and muscle wise, mm -hmm. your lovely posture muscles and the other muscles that you're tending to get as you plant at the front. And if you take your poles now, if you take your pole 
and put it in front of you and push down on the ground. But push down and then relax. You should feel your stomach muscles working. So that is all your abdominal muscles that work as well. So you get your abdominal muscles, then as you're pushing backwards, you get all your middle back muscles working. And um, yeah, I have to say, I don't know a lot about, um, and I haven't seen a lot of research about um, skeletal muscle bone and bone growth. Um, I put a link in the chat room to an article that I found on Google Scholar. Uh, it's uh, effects of short-term Nordic walking training on sarcopenia-related parameters in women with low bone mass. That's great. Well, there you go. Lovely. I didn't know that one. I'll have a look at it. Their, mm. their, yeah, their conclusion was, or their results were, significant increase in skeletal muscle mass, skeletal muscle index, strength index of the knee extensor, functional mobility and functional performance, significant decrease in body mass, that's what we all like there, body mass index and percent body fat in, per, in uh, participants. Um, what were the ages? What were the ages? Um, hold on. That's awesome. Uh, 45 women, 63 to 79 years okay. with osteopenia or osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. randomly assigned to an experimental group or and to a control group. Um, so a small sample in a there you go. population, mm -hmm. but we yeah. could extrapolate it. You could. Larger. You could. Um, yeah, the, um, I, uh, I approach, it's, I'm, I'm near, right near the campus of the University of Alabama, and I've, mm -hmm. I've sent some information to, to our uh, to, to some of the professors that I know and said, hey, there's this research going on with Nordic walking. If you have doctoral candidates who are looking for a topic, here mm -hmm. you go. And, uh, you know, Kathy, you're in Knoxville, so you could probably, if you know people at, uh, at UT, right. you could probably hit them up with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll probably swing swing by and say hello because I have a lot of friends in in the Knoxville area. Come on. Um, but yeah, this uh, <laughs> it, that's uh, that, that's one Eat way to beeps. promote more research is to is yeah. to see if your, mm. your local schools will, will will do that. And yeah, that's that's excellent. So those first couple of um, measures were to do with sarcopenia and osteoporosis. Yeah, yeah excellent. Um, I've been out of academia for a, couple, a few years now, so I'm a bit behind the times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there, there's there. Uh, this Google Scott. Let me post the link to the search results because it looks like there are several articles out there. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's right. Of Google Scholar. Because it's really good to know because a lot of the osteoporosis um, research from from my, my very um, limited knowledge, tends to be with very heavy weights and, uh, uh, and things that maybe older, maybe might not translate very well to just normal people. So to know that something like Nordic walking, which is quite a, it's, it's something you can, you know, that older people would, oh, I can do that, um, actually does that kind of, has that kind of benefit is a really good thing, yeah. If no one else has another question right away, I'm so excited. I've been kind of thinking about all of my inquiry for you over the last couple of days. I was hoping I would be able to get up early enough to uh, participate. But what about, so I work with the older population, you know, 65 would be young and um, that are concerned about terrain and the surface that they're walking on. Um, many of my clients want to use their trekking pole, hiking sticks for stability. Is there some counsel around the Nordic poles versus the urban poles around stability? 
Well, there are a couple of things there. Hello, Tracy. Tracy's on. <laughs> Um, Tracy's one of our, Tracy's the coordinator of our Bramble Bay Nordic Walkers, so lovely to see you, Tracy. Um, there actually uh, is, um, so if you're, if, if you're fit and well and you can walk fairly well, then um, uh, Nordic Poles, I, I quite like the one, the boot tip the ones with the boot shaped tips. But what I often do with people who are, as they get older, is to, that the more vertical you get your poles, the more stability and control you have over them. So that is usually where people do start to bend their elbows a little bit. So they will bend their elbows a little bit, they'll still have them behind them, but they'll have them fairly much closer to them. And so they will be able to be a bit more um, controlled and they will have that little bit more support. The urban poles and the reason that I am, the reason that I, it's a good match for me as a physio with urban poles is that they have a specific model for older adults. And these are called activator poles. And it's, it's not the, um, this is probably more a forum for people who are doing um, Nordic walking for fitness, but activator poles are different because they do not have a boot shaped tip, they have a bell shaped tip. So it looks like uh, something on the end of crutches. Uh, you know, crutches and you have those big round tips, they're flat. And, they're, and they look like a bell. And yeah, and they're probably, they're probably more like a triangle um, purushottam. So they're kind of much bigger and they have a bigger bottom on them. So that would be kind of maybe a two inch circular base. And they are held completely upright. So they're held upright and you bend, your, you do bend your elbows and you always have your elbows bent. And then they are, um, and they are more used like a walking aid. So people will walk to the shops with them or um, if they're on rough ground, they will walk on rough ground and they keep them much more um, closer to their body. So they're not really a fitness aid, they're a stability aid. And um, as far as I'm aware, Urban Polling's the only company that, that has that, that model of poll. Um, but these are just the usual polls that you use for um, just for exercise and for walking. So that's something if you have people who need a little bit of extra support, that's something that might happen. Or if they have, just your usual poles, they need to have, the more upright you hold the poles, the more stability you will get um, with them. So that's um, probably the best answer I can give with that. Mm. See, normally, may I ask something? Am I audible, please? Yes. Um, uh, normally we see different gradients, slow, or the slopes on the road. Uh, while we walking, so every time different uh, energy level is required on different roads depending on the slopes. Especially when uh, we walk in the upslope direction, the people used to bend a little forward. So to avoid that, uh, do you suggest to use the posture brace? Posture uh, brace. Uh, use the posture yeah, brace yeah. while not walking. Yeah, I, I, I don't know anything about use of posture braces. I do know that the way you walk up and down hill is, um, is a slightly different technique. So when, when you're walking up a hill, your poles are still behind you. You look up, chin always up, yeah. chest open and and yeah, you're not bent at the hips. 
you're still in a straight from your head to your tips, but you're slightly, I say to people, it's like you're leaning into the wind, you know, there's a strong wind and you're slightly pushing into the wind. So you're going towards the slope and use your arms and that should keep your, or assist to keep your shoulders back. Not sure about the use of a posture brace. The difficulty though, Purushutam, is going down the hills. So a light slope isn't too hard. When it's a very steep slope, you do have to bend your elbows more because you don't want to be pushing yourself down the hill because that will end up in grief and you'll end up going too fast and you may lose your balance. So going down the hill, I say to people, completely upright, as upright as you can, bend your elbows, have your poles closer to you, they're still a little bit behind you, and and bend your knees and you're still slight, you're almost slightly leaning back towards the hill. Slow, steady, careful. Step, step, step. And you're still right to left to right to left. Keep, always keep that, keep that, um, that opposite arm, opposite leg technique. But yeah. slow down, don't push yourself down the hill, upright and go down that way. Um, as far as the posture brace is concerned, I, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of opinion and I don't have a lot of knowledge. Uh, that's my main thing. I really don't have the knowledge. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Yeah. <laughs> Just the, you're the, uh, the way of explanation is very nice. Really, the simple language is the best criteria of proper understanding. That is what Albert Einstein said. <laughs> <laughs> Very nicely you are explaining all the things. Okay. Uh, Were you asking something, Kari? Yeah, I was just going to ask, I mean, because I'm completely new to it, but the concept of with the poles with the straps, what's the reason for opening the hand up and closing it again, you know, like releasing the handle and then holding the handle again? What's, what's the reason that you do that? Um... And again, I've, I've moved to the strapless method now. Um, I believe, and I think Leroy might be able to explain a little bit more with that, but I believe it's to give you um, that extra push. So you're mm -hmm. actually, and it came from skiing. So when you look at how skiers move, they, they really push right back to get their momentum. And so when, the, when it moved to a walking, I think they just kept that so that they could get that push for as long as possible and so increase their energy output. Uh, Leroy, you might have a bit more detail than I do about that. Yeah, or, see, yeah that's, uh, the, the, that's exactly right um, in principle. What, uh, what I tell people, See, when the, one of the first demonstrations I have people do is just simply stand still and push the pole into the ground, and they can feel all the muscles in their upper body flexing, okay? But now, if you're, when you're walking, if your uh, arm is in front and you're pushing into the ground, that's going to engage your chest mostly. But now, as, you're, as your arm swings farther back, your back muscle starts to get more involved. And, uh, and then you just keep pushing back. And, uh, and with that back swing, you, you let go of the, uh, of the, uh, of the pole. And that, that allows you to swing even farther back. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people is that's your follow through. And it's, and it's just like, if you watch a golfer, uh, the, the golfer is still swinging even after he or she has hit the ball. They're still swinging because it's a follow through. That's, you know, that allows you to, to really generate momentum, um, do you uh, maintain power. And that's the same principle in Nordic walking. So, so by letting go of that glove, uh, your, you, your backswing becomes even bigger 
and mm -hmm. and it's just a, a follow through. It gives you more power. And so you're, you know, in that backswing, you, your back muscles are are becoming more engaged, and and so that's that's where uh, where Nordic walking uh, is. Uh, you know, people when when they experiment with Nordic walking, they immediately understand why it's a whole body exercise yeah. and all the beginners in uh, in my classes tell me uh oh wow i can you know my shoulders and my back mm. uh, and my arms mm. i can really feel it yeah mm. excellent okay thank you that, that that answers that's great thank you yeah so um if you you know, just to prove it to yourself if you, you're standing behind a chair or if you are standing at the counter, just to just put one hand on it and press down and, and you can feel your, your core and your chest and all that flexing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting experience to realize how much your upper body is involved. Any other questions? We're done. <laughs> well, thank you, Juliet. Uh, this welcome. was this was wonderful. Lots of good knowledge was was thank transmitted, you. and we really appreciate everybody's enthusiasm for this and uh, the, uh, spread the word. I hope uh, uh, I hope these these things grow. It's an opportunity for the the uh, instructors to to get out and talk about what they do and also share knowledge. To, uh, to, to everyone else, about two thirds of our group, uh, of our membership, I would classify as beginners. So we, we don't want to, uh, to hoard the knowledge. We, we want to get it out there. So um, with that in mind, thank you again. We're delighted that, that you all took time and uh, we'll uh, probably sometime in June, we'll have another one and we'll, We'll move it around uh, to different time zones so that so that people don't always have to get up at four a.m. in the morning. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, I we'll we'll try to make it convenient for people that way. Yeah. Well, thank you, Leroy, people. for thank you very much. I'd just like to say thank you for having me again and for hosting this. It's been lovely, and thanks for everyone for attending. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Kathy, have a good day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. Bye. Bye all. Bye. Bye all. Thank you very much.